Hey everybody, this video is called It's Go Time, and today we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the book of Joshua, looking at the third chapter where we're going to get the instructions on how to go about crossing the Jordan River. And so, Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it states, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove, and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. So you should recall from Tuesday, when we were looking at chapter 1 and verse 11, God told the people of Israel to wait three days at the shores, at the bankments of the Jordan River. And you know, so the Jordan River, it's a flowing river. It's obviously not a still river. So how is God going to get them across that? And this chapter, we're going to get those types of answers. And, you know, it wasn't just a few people that needed to cross this river. It was all of Israel, which were millions of people. And so how will God do this? Let's go to verse 3 through 5. And uh, keep in mind that when they're crossing here, they're, they're crossing with their possessions and all that. And it says in verse 3, And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priest, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way, by which you must go, for you have not passed this before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So the Ark of the Covenant, it symbolized God's presence going before the people. And back in our study in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, and Numbers chapter 7, verse 19, we see that the Kohathites customarily would carry the ark. But in this unusual case, as they're going across the Jordan River, we see it's the Levitical priests that are transporting it. And you're going to see that in a couple chapters from now in Joshua chapter 6, verse 6. And the Levitical priests, they also transported the Ark of the Covenant later in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 3 through 6. And 2,000 cubits in verse 4, it means 1,000 yards. So if you go with a newer translation today, like New Living Translation, I believe, you're going to see probably 1,000 yards and not cubits listed. And what's cool here is that Joshua didn't have an army corps of engineers to be able to, to, to do this. He sent the priest. And so w the question that might rise is, why do the people have to stay a thousand yards behind the Ark of the Covenant? And the first reasoning would be to protect the holy nature of the Ark of the Covenant, because no man can stand directly face to face with God. That is how holy God is. And number two, it's to ensure that everyone had a clear view of the Ark. In the Ark of the Covenant, it led the way, and Israel would accomplish the task by setting their eyes on God's presence and following His presence. And the people, they had to spiritually prepare, and they had to sanctify themselves. They had to separate themselves from the common things and strictly focus on the Lord. And they were to see that God would do wonders among them. In verse 6 it says, Then Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So we should assume at this point that God commanded Joshua to do this and to have him make him remember in God's word back uh, at the crossing of the Red Sea. You see, in Joshua 1 8, you know, uh, Joshua was told to study the word of God, the law of God day and night and meditate on it. And, you know, if he was meditating on it, then he's going to know about the parting of the Red Sea. And in 
Joshua 1.8, he was called to observe it, and then his ways would be prosperous. And then he would find the success that would be needed to go to the promised land. But at the same time, outside of being observant of the word and putting it in the practice, he had to put his full faith into God. And it was he had he was still required a step of faith. In verse 7, 8, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So God encouraged Joshua all the way, and God is coming alongside Joshua and helping him to become a leader like Moses was in the eyes of the people. And God will do it by using Joshua to miraculously lead the people to cross over this impossible body of water. And so verse 8, it says that the priests were to stand in the Jordan to permit time for God's word to stimulate reflection on the greatness of God's distinguished action, action and given the land as God was showing his presence through the Ark of the Covenant. And you're going to see that in the upcoming verses ahead. And also, it was a preparation to allow the people to get set for God's miracle when God was going to stop the waters in the coming verses in verse 13 through 17 for them to be able to cross over. And so, verse 9 through 13 says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hedites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So, the verse 10, you see, it says, And Joshua said, By this you should know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hevites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. So in verse 10, we know from the book of Deuteronomy, or maybe I'm thinking of Numbers, that the Canaanite people... God commanded that they would be killed or and defeated. And the reason why is because the Canaanites were sinful to the point of being extremists, as seen as Genesis 15, verse 16, and Leviticus 18, verse 24, 25. So there's your scripture references that I was trying to think of. And God, as moral judge, he has the right to deal with people and his place and time of choosing and you know god as moral judge can judge people at any given time and it's you know god can do so when he see when he deems it appropriate for his purposes and the question that we should have or shouldn't have when we go through scripture is you know why does god choose to destroy the, these vile sinners but he let them live so long. And so why are all sinners, why aren't all the sinners destroyed far sooner than they are? And Israel's problem with the river was in the way, Israel's problem with the river in the way was a glorious opportunity to see God's work. But to linger on more with verse 10, you know, God is patient with us. There is 
what, you know, I personally refer to it as common grace, you know, that God gives rain and God provides for the just and the unjust. And so, you know, and later on in the wrap up, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a breakdown on how does God use the wicked for his purposes? But uh, verse 14, 15, it says here, So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. as And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. So the priests, they begin to move into the river. And when the priests were moving into the river, the river hadn't stopped yet. They had the view that it was going to be a dramatic move if they go into that water with the currents and everything. And we see that the description here, when they were doing this, it wasn't a dry season. It wasn't a drought that they were entering this river. It was rainy season. So the banks were overflowing in verse 16, 17, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zertan. So the waters that went down into the sea of Araba, the salt sea, failed and were cut off and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. And when I read verse 17, I say, wow. And so the God of all power does a miracle here. And we know that God created creation. That's a miracle in itself. But we see the miracle of God parting the waters and not just parting the waters, but instead of having muddy ground, God made the ground dry so that it was an easy walk through with the whole nation here. And the waters, they were dammed up at the city of Adam, and that's about 15 miles north of the crossing and also in the tributary creeks. And once the miracle was completed, you see that the waters begin to flow again when we move into chapter 4 this upcoming week. And that was after all the people, these millions of people, crossed over to the other side on dry ground. And just as Exodus had begun in Exodus 14, so it ended. And so how did God stop the water from the flow of the river? And so many people put different thoughts into it. Some people believe that God used natural means to bring that about, that he could have very done so through an earthquake. And some believe that the timing of this was through God's hand. And that's exactly where I stand. That no matter what the method is that God did this, is that it was done at God's timing and God's will. And that's all that we really need to be concerned with. And God miraculously dried up the riverbed so that they didn't have to struggle going through the mud. They didn't have to get all their belongings muddy and messy. And so God brought Israel out of bondage of Egypt back in Exodus with a miracle. And now God is bringing them into the promised land through a miracle. And so how did it happen? And we see in these 17 verses in chapter 3 here, you should notice that one of the key phrases I've been using reading throughout this was the Ark of the Covenant. And it's the Ark of the Covenant is spoken about 14 times here in chapter 3 alone. And the faith of Joshua, the faith of the priests in Israel, had in the God they knew was present with them. And so to wrap up today's uh, study... We see the instructions on how to go about crossing the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And we see that Israel, they camped out at the Jordan for three 
days. And we see the ark of God had to lead the way, which the ark of God symbolizes God's presence. And Joshua, he had to send the priests to walk across the river. And we saw that God encouraged Joshua, ensuring him that God was by his side, that God was going to use him to be in success. And then Joshua then could go on and encourage and lead Israel. And you know, that, that's where the order comes from, is anybody that's a leader for God, they can't just do it on their own. They need mentorship. And we discuss God's justice and judgment on the wicked. And we discuss how God's judgment on the wicked is at the right time, any time of a place in his choice of choosing in time. In Romans 6, 23, the apostle Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So sin is what results in death. And, you know, maybe you are asking more, you know, why doesn't God take the wicked out sooner? Why did God even let the wicked live and all that? And I believe Proverbs 16 verse 4 gives us a really good understanding. It says that God has made everything for what? It says God has made everything for his own purposes. All right, so what about the wicked? It says even the wicked for a day of disaster. And, you know, we might never wrap our minds around that. You know, why did God have evil stay in this world? But let's go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. And we're going to see that the day of disaster, this is what it's speaking about for the day of disaster. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, it says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no place before them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the death in Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we see the ultimate end time judgment known as the great white throne where the wicked and unbelievers are going to be thrown into in the day and, you know, the time ahead. And we see the faith of the priests in Joshua where they have to cross a heavy flowing river. And we see the chapter it ends with the miracle where the Jordan River is stopped for God's purpose to take place. And then the people, millions of people cross over on dry land, not muddy land, but dry land. And so Israel, they faced what seemed to be impossible challenges. And yet they had to look up to the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbolic for the presence of God to get them through. And a takeaway that we can get out of this chapter in regards to us is that no matter what impossible challenges that we face in this life, we must look up to our Joshua. And Joshua is another name for Jesus. We must look up to Jesus as Jesus is our intercessor. He's our mediator. Jesus is going to help us. And Jesus, he fulfilled the need of the Ark of the Covenant. Now I want to go over to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. It says here, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. Jesus is the presence of God. And I want to look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And this will be the last verse for this video. It says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle, spectacle, 
uh, spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus has cleared the way to victories over all things. So as Christians, when life throws lemons at us and we don't know what are we going to do about this problem, we can look unto Jesus. We need to have our eyes on Jesus and we need to be in the word of God. And so that's going to wrap up this video. We'll see you next week as we're going to look at the memorial stones that Joshua chapter 4 speaks about. So I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Uh, we're getting a heat wave up here. So hope you're starting to get nice weather where you're at. And God bless.